hearts of men. Lord, we pray today, you open the word of God to us in Jesus' name. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you grant us real understanding. A real personal application to all our problems so that we'll be free from all those problems in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you teach us and lead us into the truth that will set us free. Your word clearly says that we shall know the truth. And the truth will set us free. The truth that is filled in your word tonight, I pray, Lord, it will set us free in Jesus' name. In all the locations and all the places where this word is heard, we pray that you send out your spirit so that your spirit will set everyone free by the truth in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome everyone to the Bible study once again tonight in Jesus' name. This is a special series we just began. It's still in the Sermon of the Mount. As you know, we started the Sermon of the Mount for a long time now, since about last year. And yet, we're still not going through. We have Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. Now we're in Matthew chapter 6, and we have a special, a special kind of passage, reading from verse 25 all through to verse 34, dealing with the problem of worry and anxiety. We're going to look at another aspect of this today, and the topic for tonight is overcoming worry through faith. Look at Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat? And the body, the raiment, behold the powers of the air. For it so not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly Father feedest them. Are ye not much better than they, which of you by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take it thought for image? Consider the lilies of the field, how they sow, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet say I, I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more close to you? O ye of little faith, that's the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And here our Savior makes it very clear that his own disciples following our time shall so live as to live the overcoming life, yes, to overcome sin, but also to overcome worry, anxiety, fear, discouragement, depression, and despair. That's the overcoming life that you overcome within, overcome without, overcome in every area of your life. By the way, you see the language of the Lord Jesus Christ, he tells us in verse 25, therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life. Take in thought. And then in verse 31, therefore, Take no thought, say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or where with us shall we be clothed? And I in verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you were here last week, I explained to you that the old King James Version of English that says take no thought actually means don't worry, don't be anxious. I'm going to go through that again because of those who might not have heard that before. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 5. And when they were come to the land of Sue, Saul said to his servant, 
that was with him. Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And take thought for us. What does, what does that mean? We well, find the explanation in chapter 10 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 2. When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the court of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father has led the care, the worry, the thought of the asses, and sorrow it for you, and sorrow it for you. Being concerned for you now, so anxious and so worried about you not finding you, is sorrowful because of you, saying, What shall I do for my son? What had been spoken about in chapter 9 verse 5 has taken thought and spoken about in chapter 10 verse 2 as sorrowing for you. Being concerned for you is so sorrowful. What shall I do for my son? Now you need to understand what the anxiety does, what the worry does, what the fear, the depression, the, uh, the distress in the heart. When you are taking thought like that, when you are worried and anxious like that, you need to know what it does. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse so chapter 7 verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 7. We're looking at verse 10. And then you see it says, For the for godly sorrow, godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world. That's what anxiety brings. That's what worry brings. That's what the care in the soul, the concern in the soul, that gets into war and anxiety, that's what it brings. The sorrow of the world walketh death. What is one of the biggest problems facing men and women and children in every part of the world? The source of many of our health problems, certainly worry, anxiety and fear. Stomach ulcers, which now ranks the test in the list of fatal diseases frequently come from emotional stress caused by worry. You didn't know that, did you? That ulcers are actually terrible. And uh, when you have those ulcers, stomach ulcer, and maybe other kinds of ulcers, but the stomach ulcer in particular ranks test of all the fatal, dangerous, deadly, terminal diseases of the world. And it's caused majorly by worry and anxiety. In that, in that percentage, your patients will become happy and healthy. Notice those words, happy and healthy. You know, and it's, uh, happiness contributes a lot to your health. When you are happy, when you are joyful, when you are just excited and you live life as if there's nothing to worry about, happiness contributes a lot to your health. And it, you know, the word of God makes it very clear. As we study, you'll find out yourself. In that percentage of patients, which it, it will become happy and healthy. If they got rid of their worry and fear, and if they started living in faith and living in love, worry has been known to induce and to increase heart disease. Not only that, digestive tract ulcers. Not only that, high blood pressure. Not finish yet, depression. And then insomnia. You know, inability to sleep. When you're worried and anxious, thinking about this and thinking about that, although you close your eyes, but your mind is working, your brain is working. And it's like, you know, you cannot sleep. And you're wondering, what should I do to sleep? Get rid of worry and anxiety. And then, and we're even told that worry and anxiety may cause traumatism. He said, also, it's old age. Well, maybe it's old age, but you know, uh, the older people get, uh, the more they worry, the more they are anxious. You know, when you're very young, like an infant, like a toddler, like all these, all these young, young people, there's nothing to worry about. About food that's coming from daddy and mommy, about school fees, daddy and mommy will think about that. And about my clothing, my, you know, daddy and mommy will think about accommodation, what do I have to worry about? I'm so young, my parents will provide that. And... But as you get, as you, you know, get growing up and growing up, worry and anxiety they will begin. And then the older you get, the worry and the anxiety will be increasing. And then you have, and it says, the rheumatism caused by old age. But worry and anxiety have their parts to worry steals our joy. Worry disturbs our peace. Worry blurs our vision. Worry robs us of 
the eighth one of focus. When you are worried, you are not able to concentrate. You are distracted. Your mind is here and there. And you cannot be, you'll not be able to actually follow a page path or destination and focus your mind and focus your heart on a singular thing because of the worry and the anxiety. You want to think on this and your mind is going the other direction. And if you are like that, it will be difficult for you to make it in life. Worry weakens us. Worry paralyzes us. Worry renders us inactive and inefficient, ineffective. We destroy ourselves by worrying, by being anxious, by being fearful, we destroy ourselves with despair and discouragement. By the way, sometimes what we're worrying about is so near, but the worry and the anxiety closes our eyes that we cannot see. Blows of vision. Look at Genesis chapter 21. In Genesis chapter 21, we're looking at verse 13. Genesis chapter 21, verse 13. And also of the son of the bond woman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. Here was God talking to Abraham and talking to Abraham about Ishmael. And the mother was Hagar. And the Lord said, Even though I'm telling you to listen to Sarah, I'm sent her away with Ishmael, but I'll take care of Ishmael. And also, of the son of the bondwoman, referring to that Ishmael, will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And then it says, Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. That means the water finished. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over a gazed him a good way up. As it were, a bow short. And she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept, worry and anxiety. And you know, the Lord had given the promise, I'll take care of this child. In fact, out of this child, I'm going to raise up a nation. Didn't Hagar hear that? Didn't Abraham tell Hagar that? And then Abraham gave the bottle of water and gave bread and said, you can go, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. I said, God will take care of you. You know, some people, if they hear that, they never think about that. People are dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, and God will take care of you. Though the days of toil, through the days of toil, when your heart fails, God will take care of you. When dangers fears, does your path assail? The word of, uh, the, word of the Son says, God will take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. He can, never, he can never knew that. All that you need, he will provide. And then she just put the child here and then started crying and closed her eyes. I don't want to see the death of the child. She was so sure the child was going to die. But then you know, when dangers assail, when it appears there's nothing to take care of this infant child, God is watching and God is taking care. Trust him. And you will be satisfied because God will take care of you lonely or sad when friends are apart. When you've gone away, God will take care of you. He, he will give peace to your aching heart. God will take care of you no matter what may be the test. God will take care of you. Lean, weary one upon his breast and God will take care of you. God will take care of you. 
through every day and over all the way he will take care of you yes god will take care of you hagar did not know that and she just put the child there and then turned this other way and began to cry this child is going to die i don't want to see the death of the child in verse 17 and god heard the voice of the lad, the voice of the lad, and the angel of god called unto hagar out of heaven and said unto her what is the hagar Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for I will make him what? A great nation. The, the promise that had been given before. I can imagine Hagar saying, But you say you are going to make him a great nation. We don't even have a bottle of water to drink, and my child is dying of thirst. I want you to look at verse 19, and God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. The well of water had been there all the time, but she didn't see. Worry will close your eyes, you won't see. The fear, the anxiety will close your mind, you won't even think of solution. The worry and anxiety will blow your vision, although the well of water was so very near. Worry and anxiety will kind of kill your faith. And there will be the fear, we're going to die, my child is going to die. And the well of water was so very near, but worry will not allow you to see. The key that opens the door is very near, and yet worry and anxiety will not make you to see. And then it says, God open our eyes, God will open your eyes. You've got a certificate and you are not walking and you are crying. Blot away your tears. The tears and the worry will block your mind. You will not know what to do. There is no wife yet. There is no husband yet. Only worry and anxiety. You will not be able to hear the voice of the Lord. You are married and there is no child. And then it's only crying, worry and anxiety. Dry the tears. Because the tears, the worry, the anxiety will not allow you to see the solution. Or it is that you are working, there is no promotion. And there is no money coming in. And then all you have is worry and anxiety. Only tears. Blow the tears away. Because it is when you blow the tears away and you believe the Lord, you will see the solution. Hagar was crying, worry and anxiety. And yet, the solution was so very near. Your solution is very near. But you know, if you if you are not worried, and you know when you are not worried, if the people around you will pinch you and say, "What's the matter with you? Don't you see you have a problem?" They, they are worried and they want you to worry. They are anxious and they want you to be anxious. And they are all ruffled inside and they wonder why you are not disturbed like they are disturbed. But the peace of mind, the rest in your soul, the faith in your heart, the serenity within you that cancels every form of fear, every form of anxiety, that's what will open the way for you and then you will see. There is no mountain I cannot find. There is no river I cannot cross. There is no problem that cannot be solved. If I just take all the worry away and then look at what the Lord has given, and you'll find the solution is very near. And then the Lord said, I'm going to, I'm going to make the child a great nation. And verse 19, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the Lord. God will be with you. In all that the Lord is just saying is overcome your worry, overcome your anxiety, and then it will lead you to a better life, a happier life, a richer life. Our Lord's message in these verses of Matthew chapter 6 reveals how to effectively conquer worry and anxiety in our lives. Repeatedly commands us, encourages us. Take no thought. Be not anxious. Don't get, don't get worried. Don't be discouraged. Just look up and the solution is very near. And you know there are some people they get so worried and anxious they stop coming to church. And you know they're thinking about the problem. A Sunday morning comes. Okay, suddenly just remember the problem you have. And then you sit down, the worry, the anxiety weakens your mind and weakens your knees and weakens your body. And then it appears you're even wondering, where am I going? Why am I going to church? What is the best time to come to church when you have a problem? When you 
when you're anxious, when there are problems you cannot solve, when it's the mountain you cannot remove, that's the best time to come to church, when it's the best time to draw near to God, when you are aware of the problems that you have. But you see there are many people, when they have a whim like that, they say, what am I going to do in church? When does a sick person need a doctor? When he's sick, it's not when you are well. And when does a sinner need a savior? When he feels the weight of his sin. When does the bound person, when does he need the deliverer? When you feel the bondage. And when does a worried, anxious person need Jesus Christ, the deliverer and the liberator? It is when you have the depression, the discouragement, the worry and the anxiety. You run to the Lord and say, I must be in church today because of the problems that overwhelm me. Don't ever make the mistake in your life when you are sad, when you are sorrowful, when you have a problem and think that you are not coming to church today because you have a problem. That's the best time to come to church. You're welcome. We're going to look at the message of overcoming worry with faith. And we're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, God's house and habitation, our body. Then number two, God, gracious healing for the body. And then number three, glorious holiness in the body. We're looking at a Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 25. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 25, here is what it says, Therefore I say unto you, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, What ye shall eat, Or what ye shall drink, Or not yet for your body, What ye shall put on, Is not the life more than meat, And the body more than raiment? Actually the Lord asked a series of questions, that the people who are asking themselves in their worry, in their anxiety, what are the questions? What shall we eat? That alone, that alone. Gets people so worried, so worried. They're not even thinking about what we're going to eat today. What are we going to eat tomorrow and next week and next year? What are we going to eat for the rest of our lives? They're not satisfied with the provision of today. Give us this day our daily bread. What shall we eat? The future is coming. The economy is going now. What shall we eat? And then what shall we drink? What shall we drink? And where with that, what shall we put on? All these express concern for the body. For many people, these concerns lead to worry. They lead to anxiety. And the neglect of their soul and spirit. They're so concerned about the body, they forget the soul. They're so concerned about uh, the provision for the body. They forget the provision, eternal provision for the eternal and never dying soul. And then uh, they neglect not only that, they, they neglect other important things. Their morals, their character, their behavior, their relationship with God, the service of the Lord that they neglect. Because they're so worried and anxious about the provisions for the body. In many, in many Christians, the erroneous thought that God only cares for spiritual life. But is not concerned about her body and temporal needs heightens their worry and anxiety. They trust God for salvation, not for daily bread, not for daily sustenance, and for, not for the daily needs. They can trust God for spiritual things, but they cannot trust God for temporal material things. Some people think that a body is not even important to God. There are people that feel that it's just a body, it's just a flesh, and it carries no value in the sight of the Lord. It, it's they that think such thoughts feel that God has saved our souls and he has left our bodies for us to take care of by ourselves. Nothing can be farther from the truth. He who created the body will also close the body. He who created the body will also feed that body. He who created the body will also keep that body. And look at what the Bible says concerning our body, the body of the Christian. And then you will know how God must take care of that body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Think about that. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? 
don't you know that uh, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Do you think, uh, you know, look up here, somebody builds a church building, a temple, and he has provided the money for all the foundation, for the cement, for the gravel, for the slaves, for the everything. And then is you are worried that this man who has got money to build the scene, will he have money to paint the building? Of course, yes. That's common sense. Well, tell us that if he has got the money to put up this kind of building, and he has spent so much in building all this, and he's put it in place, it should not be difficult for him to have money to do the painting. But people don't realize he's giving us this body, a kind of marvelously created body. And the Lord is saying, but your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You are not your own. And if God has given us such a body, will he not just close that body? That's the conclusion. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Not only your soul, not only your spirit, but in your body as well. And in your spirit, which are God's. And let's look at First Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. What the Lord is saying is, don't you know that your body is a great gift from God? And if God has put together the body, the bones, the flesh, the blood system, everything, the nerves, the brain, every part of your body, if the Lord has given you so great a marvelous body, don't you think He'll feed that body? That's the conclusion. That's why I say it's not the body more than the meat. It's not the body more than the food. And if, has, if he has given us such a great gift, don't you think he'll give the lesser one? Then in, in verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? Which temple ye are? It says that you are the temple of God. The temple of God. And you know, there are some people that have so much worry and so much anxiety. And they think that, you know, they are saved. They are born again. Their souls are secured in the hands of the Lord. But their problem is the thing that witches and wizards will destroy their body. That witches and wizards will be able to put affliction and uh, whatever it is upon their body. And they're always in that fear. If they go this way, they fear of witches and, uh, witches and wizards. They go that way, they, which, uh, they fear of sorcerers. They go that way, they, they fear of herbalists. And it says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it says that temple is holy. Which temple ye are? And it says, if any man, if any herbalist, if any witch doctor, if any witch or wizard tries to destroy or defile that body, him will God destroy. You understand? You are not just an ordinary temple. You are not just an ordinary building. We are God's building. We are God's sanctuary. And we are God's temple. And if anybody tries to destroy that temple, tries to destroy your body, it says, him shall God destroy and look at it. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're looking at verse 39. Luke chapter 12. Verse 39. Remember, you are a temple, you are a building, you are a sanctuary of the Lord. In Luke chapter 12, verse 39. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have washed and not have suffered his house, his house, his house would be broken through. And what the Lord is telling us is that any house at all, not even a temple now, if the landlord of that house and if the good man of that house had known the hour the thief will come to break through into the house, it will, it will be on guard. And it will not allow any thief, any robber, any destroyer to come unto his house and to destroy his house. And it says, you you are the house of God. You are the temple of God. You are the sanctuary, the building of God. And God is watching over you. And if God is watching over you, why the anxiety and why the fear? And we're looking at John chapter 2 verse 14. 
in John chapter 2, reading from verse 14, all through to verse 17. And if I'm found in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and draw and draw and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made this coach of small cars, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, and make not my father's house and house of merchandise. I want you to look up here. I know you've, you've read that passage of the Bible before, but you see, when believers read their Bible, and their mind is just on their straight line, one interpretation, they don't understand. I want you to picture in your mind. Here is a physical building. And the people who are worshipping there, they are Pharisees and Sadducees. And these religious people that were under the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they are coming there to worship. And then even though those people did not have salvation, they didn't understand salvation, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus came, he wanted to enter to that temple. And then he saw these people that were selling doves and selling sheep and selling other things, leave that apart. Here is now, I put you on the other side. Here we have another temple. This one is a temple of blocks and cement and mortar, whatever. But it's physical temple. This one is a fleshly temple, but then the Holy Ghost is in that temple. And then the glory of God is shining through that temple. And then we have the word of God inside that temple. And then we have the evangel, the gospel that is to be preached to all the world. We have each in that gospel. And then we have the life of Christ inside that temple. And Jesus comes, he sees this physical building, a temple. He sees the other, or the other one, a temple, but a temple of the Holy Ghost. And now he, he sees that there's something wanting to trouble the temple of the Holy Ghost. Will he only cleanse the physical temple and leave the other temple and allow it to suffer? The answer is no. When he came and he saw that temple, and then he saw that they were selling this and he missed God and drove every, everyone, every one of them out. If Christ will do that to the physical temple, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were worshipping, what the people that did not have salvation, where they were congregating every Sabbath day, if Jesus will say, take this away from here and make not my father's house a house of merchandise, if he will do that, will he just allow me his temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost? Christ lives in the believer. And Jesus, Jesus said the Holy Ghost is also in the believer. And then we are the temple of God. God resides within us, and the word of God is within us. And then the, the hope of the world resides within us, because we are the people to take the gospel across to the world. And then, if he now sees me as a temple of God, a temple of the Holy Ghost, a sanctuary of the Lord himself, and he sees all those things wanting to afflict me and wanting to destroy me, will he just open his eyes and allow this temple to be destroyed, the answer is no. He'll take care of the temple. And people need to realize, when you know that, there's no worry. When you know that, there's no anxiety. Because you know, the Lord will definitely take care. The Bible also calls us habitation of God. And let's look at um, Exodus chapter 15 verse 2. Exodus chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 2. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. And then he says, He is my God. I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, I will exalt him. You know what Moses was talking about. I will prepare him an habitation. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, they prepared him the tabernacle. That is a physical structure. That's what they meant. I'll prepare him a habitation. But the question today is, what kind of habitation I will, pro I will provide it for him? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows in unto an holy temple in the Lord. All the building fitly framed together. He's talking about believers, and he says, well, Framed together, in whom also ye are, ye also are built together, you believers, you are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. An habitation of God through the Spirit. Our body then is God's temple. Number two, our body is God's house. Number three, our body is God's habitation. Will he not take care of his temple? He will. Will he not provide adequately for his house? Of course he will. Will he neglect his habitation? No, he will not. We have known the truth today and the truth has set us free. The knowledge concerning our body as God's temple sets us free from worry and anxiety. Our body actually belongs to him. And because it belongs to him, then we know. Is going to take care of that body and of that life. He was giving us such a great gift as a body and as a life. Will, not, will he not also give us what to eat and what to drink and what to put on to maintain that body and to maintain that life? That's why Jesus asked the question in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. What a great question this is that we need to think about. It says in the latter part, it's not the life more than the meat, but he has given you the life. If he has given you the greater one, will he not give the one that is less? And then it says, and the body more than raiment, more than clothing. And if he has given you the body, will he not give you the clothing? Of course he will. Let's look at Psalm 105. Psalm 105. Point of 5, verse, 5, verse 13. When they went from one nation to another, and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. He permitted no man to do them wrong. You remember Balak and Balaam? He did not permit Balaam to do them wrong. You remember the Amalekites? He will not allow them to do them wrong. You remember the Moabites? He will not permit them to do them wrong. And you remember in the wilderness, there are many, many scorpions and serpents in the wilderness. But you know, they didn't even know there were scorpions there. They didn't know there were serpents there. Those children of Israel, it's only when they offended the Lord, it's only when they disobeyed the Lord, it's only when they spoke against God and he spoke against Moses that they knew that there were serpents in the wilderness. And when you're living a righteous life, a holy life, a scriptural life, you'll not know there are witches in the world. You'll not know there are you know, all the serpents in the world. You just live your life because the Lord will take you through. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're reading verse 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness. Stop there for a moment. You see, they were just walking along. They didn't know it was a terrible wilderness until they began to complain, until they murmured, until they disobeyed God, until they sinned against God. You will not know the world is a terrible world until you disobey God. You just live a life that is free, free of care and free of problem and free of all these oppression and attacks of the enemy when you are living in righteousness. It says, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fairy serpents and scorpions and drudge where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. You see that? And the wilderness was filled with scorpions and serpents and a lot of terrible things. But ne they never knew that. The only time they knew that is when they murmured against God and against Moses. And if you'll just live your life in righteousness, you'll not know that there are terrible things in the world. The Lord will protect you. And the Lord will take care of you. But told in Psalm 105, Verse 14, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. 
Uh, you know, I pity those uh, prophets who are so worried and anxious. Uh, prophets and preachers and proclaimers of the gospel. Who think witches are after them and, you know, wizards are after them, harbalists are after them. Why are you a prophet? Why are you a preacher? Why are you a proclaimer of the truth? If all those things are still after you. If, if you're a minister of the gospel, if you're a child of God, and the Lord has sent you, go and preach the gospel to the whole world. He has commanded all those evil people not to touch you, and they dare not touch you. I said they dare not touch you. What, what uh, destroys us preachers is not the people of the world. It's not the witches. They don't have that power. What destroys us is our worry, our anxiety, our fear. Your fear kills you more than the things that are coming from the world. And actually when you know the Lord and when you know the promises of God, there is nothing to fear. I said there is nothing to fear. Zechariah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 5, For I, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. A wall of fire round about. I hope you understand. You need to understand. And you know, these days, when, when people build a house, they make a wall around that house. And all the wall they can make is a wall of um, a wall of brick, a wall or a wall of uh, cement. But God says, "You are my house, and then because you are my house, you are my sanctuary, and you are my building, I make a wall, not of brick or block, a wall of fire around you." I'm telling you that those evil paths cannot penetrate anymore. And you're secured because you are God's temple. You are God's house and you are God's habitation. For I, I, says the Lord, will be unto thee, unto her, a wall of fire round about her, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Verse 8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory has sent me unto the nations, will spoil you, for he that toucheth you, Touches the apple of his eye. We come to point number two now. Gracious healing for the body. Gracious healing for the body. And the things that worry people, that make people anxious, is about their health. Am I going to stay healthy? Am I going to stay strong? Worry in the mind is as common as sickness in the body. Think about that. Worry in the mind is as common as sickness in the body. That's another way of saying where you have worry in the mind. It's just a matter of time. There's going to be sickness in the body. Because worry and anxiety in the mind will attract sickness into the body. And because uh, you know that worry and, worry and anxiety, they actually sum up together to bring fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is actually faith in the negative. And fear is saying, you're going to die. You're going to get sick. This sin is going to kill you. And you're wondering, I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. Because of this and because of this. And your faith, negative faith, which is actually the fear, the worry, the anxiety, is already attracting negative things into your life. And it is so, because it's to you according to your faith. And then you lie down there just like you said. You're not able to sleep because you said you'll not be able to sleep. The worry, the anxiety, attracting failure, attracting defeat, attracting sickness, attracting disease into your life. And that's why and sickness is as common as worry is common in the mind. Many who are healthy are worried about the possibility and probability of becoming sick. They worry until they become sick. Those who are sick, they worry about how to get well. Or they worry and say they don't know whether they're ever going to get well. One thing is such a worry and anxiety will never improve any situation or condition in life. Worry and anxiety will never improve any situation in life. And let's say something bad is happening. And then you're worried. What will the worry do? Let's say your enemy is, is running after you. And then you're worried. What will the worry do? How will the worry kill or destroy or send away the enemy? Let's say somebody is tormenting your life. Let's say somebody does not want you to rest. And is doing this and doing this and doing that. What will the worry do? The worry will not stop them. 
the worry will not solve the problem. The worry will not silence them. The worry will not make them to quit what they are doing. They have, even if negative things are happening, there's no point worrying because the worry, the anxiety, will not solve the problem. In fact, you know, when people are doing bad things to you in your neighborhood, when people are doing bad things to you in your place of work, and pe when people are threatening you, and it appears you, you, you put the key of your life in their hand, when you tell them, you worry me to death, then they know they can worry you to death. You scare me to death. Then they know they can scare you to death. Then you say, you don't allow me to rest. Give me some chance. Then they know the key of your happiness is, is in their life, is in their hands. But even if they're doing the things they're doing, even if you didn't know how to pray, if you just, you know, go about and carry your cross with a smile, and just smile it off, and just laugh it off, whatever they do, and whatever they say, however they act, they just laugh it off, then eventually they'll get tired when the things, the seed they sow is not growing, and the work they do is not progressing. And the trouble they make is not bearing any fruit. And you just live your life, and the more they cause you worry, the thing they cause you worry, the more you are happy. And the more you are kicking, and the more you are going on, and the more you live your life. Then they will stop. They look for another target to go and trouble. But when you worry, when you are anxious, they do this, and they do this, and they do that. And you worry about that. It's not what they do that kills you. It's the worry and the anxiety that you have that's actually killing you. And therefore, we need to understand worry and anxiety will never improve any situation or condition in life. Stop worrying and start looking for the remedy. The remedy will come. And it says, which of you by taking thought, which of you by worrying, which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit unto his stature? But it's when you manifest faith in the Lord. If you are well, manifest faith in the Lord. If you are sick, manifest faith in the Lord. Because faith and holiness will prolong our lives. Give me a good amen. amen. Faith and holiness. Holiness and faith. Just those two things. And when you have those two things, there's nothing to worry about. You don't worry about Satan. He's conquered already. You don't worry about demons. They're defeated already. You don't worry about wicked men. You don't worry about enemies because they're conquered already. You don't worry about necessities of life because they're supplied already. There's nothing to worry about. Faith and holiness. Holiness and faith will solve the problems and keep you healthy. Second Kings chapter 20. In 2 Kings chapter 20, in those days, verse 1 was Ezekiel sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. I'm sure you've heard the story before, but the point is this. He was a king, but there was one thing in his life he wasn't happy about. He had no child. And as a king that had no child, you see, in Israel, whenever they die, they handed over the kingdom to their sons, their first son. Christianity is not like that, though, because Peter did not hand over to his son, Paul did not hand over to his son, John did not, uh, the, uh, the John the beloved did not hand over the right of relation to his son. So say, hey, my son, go and give this. All they had, they were sons in the faith. But in the kings of the Old Testament, they handed over to their sons. And then now, Ezekiel did not have any son. And Isaiah said, set your house in order, for you will die. That's what makes people worried. I have all this mansion, but it's no charge. I have all this success, but it's no charge. I have this, I have that, but it's no charge. Worry and anxiety will not give you children. Only faith and holiness. Stop worrying. I said, just drop the bombshell. Set your house in order. 
for you will die. And then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, you will not know the death of his request until you know what he actually had in mind. O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiah wept so, faith but not worry, holiness but there's no anxiety, and it came to pass. And for Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Ezekiah the captain of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Prayer without worry, I have heard thy prayer. Prayer without anxiety, I have heard thy prayer. Don't worry. Don't worry about what Isaiah said. Don't worry about what all those other people say. About the dream, you know, some people, a dream of the night will spoil their day. The next day will even spoil the whole week. I had a dream, I had a dream, I had a dream. And the dream causes only an anxiety. Sometimes a prophecy from somebody from one church, they don't know where, will cause holy and anxiety. Somebody came to give them a prophecy and said, this will happen, this will happen. It gets them into worry and anxiety. But Hezekiah, he didn't worry. He just prayed. You will pray. And God will answer your prayer. And then it says, and you said unto him, I've had your prayer. I've seen your tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt, shalt, thou shalt go unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days. How many years? Fifteen years. Fifteen years. You know, when he died, his son that came to reign. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. And Manasseh was twelve years old when he began to reign. God gave him 15 years. It took him three years after the healing before the child came. By the time he died, the child was 12 years of age. That's why, it was, that's why he had to cry to the Lord. When I said, you will die. He said, how can I die now? There's no child to take over from me. And because of that, he prayed. The point is, child or no child, there's no worry. There's no anxiety. Because after all, the worry will not bring the child. The worry and anxiety will not bring the miracle. It is faith that will bring the miracle. In fact, worry and wickedness will, will cut short our lives. Look at Psalm 55. Psalm 55, when you are worried and anxious, and then you are not even living right, that cuts short the life. In Psalm 55, verse 23, But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Glory and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Deceitful men, bloody men, will not live out half their days. What's the meaning of that? The meaning of that is that, I don't like to say it, but it's the truth. Wicked men, your enemies, they will die before you. I don't like to say it, but that's what the Bible says. That wicked men, the enemies of the righteous, we don't need to worry about them. They will disturb my life. They will kill me. No, they will not kill you. They will die before you die. Because it says, bloody men, deceitful men, shall not live half their days. They cut short their lives by the wickedness. You just be holy and happy. And be healthy and just rejoice and live a life without care, a life without worry, a life without anxiety, and you will live long. In Proverbs chapter 10, Proverbs chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. That is when you fear the Lord and you honor the Lord, it says your life will be prolonged, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. And therefore you see the people who are wicked, they're not, they're not righteous, they're not living right, and at the same time they are worried to death 
they worry themselves and worry, worry until they die. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 17. Be not overmuch wicked. Be not overmuch wicked. Why is, it, why is this saying be not overmuch wicked? Look up here. All sinners are wicked. There's, you know, normal simple things that people do because they don't have the grace of God. But there are some of them that now go overboard. They go beyond the normal wickedness of sinners. They go beyond the normal sinfulness of sinners. And they, they put some extra, extra effort into their wickedness. And Solomon is saying, be careful. All these sinners are there. We know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you are going too far. You are adding too much to your wickedness. And it says in that verse 17, be not over much wicked. Neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? You know, those people that do not, they never think of any other thing except wickedness. They don't even try to kind of uh, moderate it a little and, you know, so pedal. They just think of evil and they do evil all the time. Your cause short shall lie in uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 17, we're looking at verse 11. As a partridge seated on eggs, and catches them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall lead them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. And that tells us then there's nothing to worry about if you're a child of God. You're a child of God, just live a righteous life, a holy life, a sanctified life. A scriptural life, a Christ-like life, and then live without anxiety, and live without worry, and live with faith, and your faith will carry you through. Yeah. Our gift is a gift from God, and the healing of the health of that body, when we maintain the body in a proper functional state, is also a gift from God. In times of sickness, we do not fear or worry. Faith freely receives healing from God, healing from our Heavenly Father. And the Lord will give it to us. We we'll come to point number three now, glorious holiness in the body. We we'll come to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, here is the Lord and the Master, our Savior, saying unto us, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Don't be worried about your life. You know, sometimes there's a widow that is thinking, the breadwinner is gone. Don't worry about that. God is greater than the breadwinner. I say God is greater than the breadwinner. Sometimes the orphan that is saying, no daddy and no mommy. What am I going to do? Don't worry about that. God is greater than daddy and mommy. And if God is still there, God never dies. I said God never dies. Although father is dead and mother is dead. But don't say I'm a fatherless, a fatherless person. I'm just an orphan. No, you are not. Because the almighty God is there. And he says, take no thought for your life. You know, sometimes calamity has come upon calamity. Whatever calamities have come will not be up to the stage of that of Job. And yet, you can still rest assured, I know my Redeemer liveth. Whatever has happened in the family, to the children, to your body, to your cattle, to your sheep, to your goats, and to everything that you have, God is still on the throne. And you can still say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's why Jesus said, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. It's not the life more than the meat, and then the body more than raiment. The Lord is telling us, because He says, because of who we are, there's nothing to worry about. And just make up your mind from tonight, there's nothing to worry about. Everybody can you say that there's nothing to worry about. 
Somebody gives you bad information, and then what's your reply? There's nothing to worry about. Some, have you heard? Have you heard? What's your reply? There's nothing to worry about. And then they say, they're retrenching people in your place of work. Do you know that? There is nothing to worry about. The doctor said, as doctor showing you the medical report of what you went for, and then you say, there is nothing to worry about. And you're getting married, and they say, you should go for tests. And then they say, have you seen the test already? The result of the test? And then you say, what? There is nothing to worry about and then you say you're going to get married and have you got apartment accommodation now what's the answer there is nothing to worry about and then they say the you know the wedding time is coming how many suits do you have there is uh, nothing to worry about with your father accepted this and that what's the answer there is nothing to worry about change your language Instead of worry, 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 anxiety and anxiety. And when you go back tonight, home and you want to sleep, and you know some people, I don't know why they do that. I don't know why they do that. You know, it's when you get back home, they got that letter from the morning. They didn't give you when you came back from work. And just at the time you're going to sleep, they said, you have a letter. And then they give you the letter. And you, you are so much in a hurry. I don't know why people are so much in a hurry to read all these letters. It's not every letter you read before you go to sleep. And then they open the letter and they read something. Whatever you read there, what's the answer? There's nothing to worry about. And your wife said, Daddy, what did they write there? You know, she wants to borrow part of the worry and the anxiety. And what do you tell her? There's nothing to worry about. And the results, you know, you've taken your exam, the result is they pasted the eight on the board. And then somebody comes to you and he says, I've gone to see my result. Have you gone to see your own? There's nothing to worry about. You just live your life. And if there's nothing to worry about, there's nothing to worry about. When you tell the devil there's nothing to worry about, he will not give you a hard time. When you tell your enemies there's nothing to worry about, they will not give you any hard time. In your life, from morning till evening till night, there is nothing to worry about. Live your life like that, and you will be free from worry and anxiety in Jesus' name. Because number one, you are the habitation of God. Number two, you are the temple of God. Number three, you are the house of God. If you are the habitation of the Lord, you must be holy. If you are the temple of God, you must be holy. If you are the house of God, you must be holy. Once holiness is there and righteousness is there, then we know there is nothing to worry about. We're looking at uh, First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Then it says, if we can know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ, think about that. Your body is a member of Christ. And it says, shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of an hand of God forbid? What? Know ye not that he which is joint on hallowed is one body for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, because your body is a member of Christ, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, there must be a concept you have, an understanding you have, a conviction you have, that there must be holiness in that temple. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the second part of verse 17. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It's not only that, you are also the habitation of the Lord. You are the temple, and the temple must be holy. And then you are also the habitation. Deuteronomy chapter 26. 
Deuteronomy chapter 26, reading from verse 15. Look down from thy holy habitation, the holy habitation from heaven, and bless thy people Israel. It says, God's habitation in heaven is a holy habitation. But do you remember that you now, you are the habitation of the Lord here on earth. In Hebrews chapter, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 21. In whom all the building filled the frame together, grows unto an holy temple in the Lord. And it says now, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. An habitation of God through the Spirit. And that habitation must be holy. Remember to you that you are the house of God. Now what, what kind of house should that be? Let's look at First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 3. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have set my affection to the house of my God. I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. I have prepared for the holy house. Is the house of my God because it's the house of my God is the holy house. Now you come to the New Testament and see the spiritual interpretation of the house. Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, looking at verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? We are the house of Christ and the house of God. And because of that, there is something that is demanded of us that is holiness. If you are a real child of God, you have the understanding you are the house of God. And if you are the house of God, then you understand there is this glorious holiness that you possess and that you also preserve and that you there share forth with the people. In Psalm 93, Psalm 93, verse 5, that testimonies are very sure holiness becomes thine house, O Lord, forever. If you are the house of God, and you are, if you are a child of God, then it says, Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. That means then you are not conscious that you are not just an ordinary person, you are not a dick or Harry, and you are, you are the house of God, the temple of God, the habitation of God. And because of that, holiness must be reflected in your life. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 12, your body now that you keep holy. Your body that you keep pure. Your body that you keep righteous. Your body that you keep all the actions Christ-like. Romans chapter 6 verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You see, holiness will give you confidence in God. Faith in God. There will be nothing to worry about. There will be nothing to be anxious about. If any problem arises, she know by the grace of God, there is a temple of God, and it's a holy house habitation of the Lord. And you're able to go and pray with real confidence. But you see, sin will destroy that confidence. Sin will destroy your faith. And sin will not give you the boldness you ought to have in the presence of the Lord when you pray. That's why it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Your members... Your hands, your mouth, your eyes, your ears, 
your feet, your legs, your mind, your brain, every faculty of the members of your body. You yield everything to righteousness. That's what gives you confidence. That's what gave Ezekiah confidence. That's why he had no worry. He had no anxiety. When you are living in private sin, secret sin, there's worry, there's anxiety. I hope they don't know. I hope they have not discovered. I hope they know it's, I hope they feel it's not me. And when this one is looking at you, does he know about, it gives you one an anxiety. But when there's holiness and purity and righteousness, you're totally free in your heart. And then you're able to express yourself the way you need to express yourself. No anxiety, no worry, no fear. And there's body in the heart. That's why it says in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For she have yielded your members, servants, from cleanness unto, uh, unto iniquity, unto iniquity. Iniquity. Even so, now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. In chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 10. And if Christ be in you, if he dwells in you, as he dwells in the holy temple, as it dwells in the holy sanctuary, as it dwells in the holy house, holy habitation. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That is, the body is dead to sin, does not respond to sin, does not yield to sin, does not give in to sin. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Then it says in verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We are going to live. And that's why if you want to keep a clear conscience, a conscience, a heart not body, will worry your anxiety. Then you live a life that is free from sin. And you bring all the members of your body under control. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep under my body. That's the person that doesn't want to have any guilt, any condemnation, any anxiety, any worry, any burden. I keep my body under. That's the person that doesn't want to have any accusation of the enemy. He doesn't want to have an accusation that will lead him to worry and anxiety. The devil said, ah, you want to go and win souls and go and preach. See what you are doing in secret. You want to go and preach. See your life. Uh, I'll disgrace you before those people. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. If you're living right. That's why Paul the Apostle said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that... By any means, when I preach to others, I myself shall be a castaway. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. You want to live a life without worry, without anxiety, abstain from all appearance of evil. No skeleton in your cupboard. Your heart is clear. Your mind is pure. Your heart is holy before the Lord. Abstain from all appearance of evil. There's no accusation from the devil that can take any root in your life because you are stained from all appearance of evil. And because of that, no burden, no yoke, no condemnation, no worry, no anxiety. You are free, as free as a bird in the air. And then it says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray that God, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and what? And body. And body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Worry and anxiety lead to compromise and sin. Worry and anxiety. If I don't do what they are saying, you are worried about promotion. You'll compromise, you'll sin. If I don't go the way, the, I, the pressure they are putting upon me, if I don't yield to that pressure, you are worried, you are anxious, they will put more pressure. What if they put more pressure? Fear not them who is able to kill the body. And after that, they have nothing else they can do. 
And I will forewarn you who to fear. Fear God, who is able to kill the body and drive the soul into hell. I say unto you, fear him. They're not fearing man. What can they do? What can they do beyond the permission of God? Fear not man. You see, when you fear man, you'll get into all in anxiety and you will compromise and sin. When the heart is preoccupied with, what shall we eat? If I lose my job now, what am I going to eat? You'll compromise your sin. And then that same partner, you know, you've been sinning before. Now you, you've given your life to the Lord. And then he comes again and he says, uh, how about it? Well, if I decline, if I reject now, where will I get money? That's the problem. The worry and anxiety will lead you into sin. But when you say holiness is number one, food is not number one, job is not number one, promotion is not number one, friendship is not number one, the favor of the people is not number one, holiness is number one. And when you put holiness as number one, freedom from persecution is not number one. Freedom from all the attacks of the people, that's not number one. It's because you put all that as number one. That's why holiness is not taking effect in your life. But when you put holiness as number one, then the Lord will take care of the rest. Or shall we drink? Where will that? Shall we be closed? Then you will sacrifice your conviction on the altar of material pursuit. What is the evidence of unbelief and distrust in God? Because of unbelief, they had the past from the living God. This content soon takes over one's life. And the members of the body may begin to yield to righteousness. But freedom from worry helps us to have peace of mind. And our faith rests on the faithfulness of God who feeds the birds and clothes the lilies. Knowing that our Heavenly Father will supply. Our needs, according to His riches in glory, we throw away all our anxious cares and spend our days on earth doing God's will and living in holiness and righteousness. We keep our body holy as God's temple while trusting Him that His house, that is our body, will not lack any good thing. Purity, peace, prosperity will be ours without subjecting our minds and lives to the strain and the drain of worry and anxiety. From today we are free. Amen. I said you are free. Amen. Because we are told in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, Verse 36, John chapter 8, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Tonight I am free. Tonight I am free. I am free from worry. I am free from anxiety. I am free from the fear of man. I am free from the fear of the future. God supplies all my needs. Body, soul, and spirit. Say it aloud. Body, soul, and spirit. I am free. All my needs are supplied. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. How are you going home tonight? What will you eat when you get back home? Your landlord is waiting for you. When you get to the place of work tomorrow, what if they don't greet you? What if your persecutors become stronger? What if they frown at you? There is a demon at the backyard. Somebody is trying to hurt you. Are you free? Rise up and tell the Lord, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Free from all body, and free from all the yokes, and free from all the harassment of the devil. You're free from worry and anxiety. Free! Free! There's nothing to worry about. God is taking care of you, my brother. God is taking care of you, my sister. Nothing to worry about. The frowns of men, nothing to worry about. The persecutions of persecutors, nothing to worry about. They only kill themselves and destroy themselves with their wickedness. You also remain alive. 
much, much longer after they have all died. Nothing to worry about. They can't hurt you. They can't even disturb you. There's nothing to worry about. Your destiny is not in their la is not in their hands. There's nothing to worry about. Your joy, your happiness is not in their hands. There's nothing to worry about. Even though there were serpents and scorpions in the wilderness, nothing to worry about. Witches and wizards in the land, nothing to worry about. The pestilence that is going during the day, nothing to worry about. And the attacks in the night time, there's nothing to worry about. And about marriage, there's nothing to worry about. And about having children, there's nothing to worry about. And about getting a job, there's nothing to worry about. And about the result of my exam, there's nothing to worry about. On the land, on the sea, in the air, there's nothing to worry about. In the village and in the city, there is nothing to worry about. In the church, there's nothing to worry about. In the community where I live, there's nothing to worry about. When all those enemies, tens of thousands of them, when they hover around me, and when they run after me wanting to eat up my flesh, there is nothing to worry about. Before Goliath or Pharaoh Nebuchadnezzar, there's nothing to worry about. When they hit the corn is seven times hotter, there's nothing to worry about. And when the lion's den is open, there is nothing to worry about. When sickness attacks the body, there's nothing to worry about. And when they're trying to take your right away from you, there's nothing to worry about. Why are you worried? There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. Your daughter, your daughter has uh, gone uh, out and has not come back. There's nothing to worry about. God is taking care of her. Your son, you have not seen your son for a few weeks now. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. Worry and anxiety become strangers to you. Nothing to worry about. What are you going to eat tonight? There's nothing to worry about. What are you going to put on tomorrow? There's nothing to worry about. When are you going to have this promotion? There's nothing to worry about. He gave you the body, he'll give you the food. He gave you the body, he'll give you the clothing. He gave you the body, he'll give you the protection. He gave you the body, he'll give you the provision. He gave you the body, he'll give you the happiness and the joy and the sustenance and the prosperity. There's nothing to worry about. No worry, no anxiety, I'm free. No worry, no anxiety, you're free. You're free. You're free in the soul. You're free in the spirit. You're free in the mind. You're free in the body. You're free in your house. You're free in your family. You're free in your place of work. You're free everywhere. Free, free, free. The Lord has set you free. There's nothing to worry about. They want to take your position away from you. There's nothing to worry about. They want to kind of destroy what you are building. There is nothing to worry about. They want to scatter your, your work. There's nothing to worry about. And they want to make you turn away from your, from your reward, from your gain. There's nothing to worry about. They want to disturb your progress. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing. Nothing on earth. Nothing under the earth. Nothing anywhere. Nothing anywhere to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free, free indeed. Free your soul and free your spirit and free your body. Free in your mind. You're free. Nothing, nothing, nothing to worry about. Give your life to the Lord fully. Rely on the Lord completely. Lean upon the arms of the Almighty. And there is nothing, nothing, nothing to worry about. Your enemies cannot hurt you. There's nothing to worry about. Pharaoh could not hurt Moses. There's nothing to worry about. Balaam could not cause Israel. There is nothing to worry about. And Sisera could not defeat. Deborah, there's nothing to worry about. 
even a half could not touch Elijah, there is nothing to worry about. Goliath could not kill David, there is nothing to worry about. He put Peter in the prison and he slept, nothing to worry about. The angel came and then he rose up, he put up, he put on his sandal, and he was going to the iron gate to open automatically for them. Nothing to worry about. In that same chapter, Herod that wanted to kill Peter, Herod died in that same chapter. Church, there is nothing to worry about. I'll take care of you through every day. All over the way, yes, God will take care of you. He takes care of his own. He takes care of his own. Nothing to worry about. Make sure you're giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a child of God. Whatever problems arise, God is more than that problem. It's greater. Greater than your mountain. Greater than a heartache. Greater than a challenge. Greater than the enemies you face, greater than all the fears of your life, greater the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That power is still available today. And if that power can raise the dead, that power can roll the mountain of your life away. There is nothing to worry about. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought. Be not anxious, be not worried. What shall we eat? Don't worry. What shall we drink? Don't worry. With what shall we be closed? Don't worry. And over your life to the Lord. You say, Lord, I give you the key of my life. The key of my life is not the hand of an enemy. It's not in the hand of a tormentor, the key of my life. It's not in the hand of a persecutor. I give you the key of my life. Take care of me, Lord, and you will take care. And then from tonight, you stop worrying and you start living. You stop worrying and you start living a joyful life, a happy life, a satisfactory life. A joyous life, a life that is fully pre pro provided for. No worry, no anxiety. You sleep well, you live well, you walk well, you do everything well that you ought to do. Nothing, nothing, nothing to worry about. Don't allow the key of your life to be in the hand of any enemy. Turning you here and there, like we turn the door upon the hinges, controlling your life. Don't allow them. Smile it off. Laugh it off. You're free. Because the sun has set you free. Free from sin, free from condemnation, free from worry, free from anxiety, free from fear, free, totally free. Accept that freedom, rejoice in that freedom. Lord, I thank you. How great, how wonderful it is to be free. How wonderful to be free from worry, free from anxiety. To be totally free, totally free, completely free. Because the Son, the Son, the Son of God who died on the cross for you. That Son of God has set you free. Has set you free. Make sure you are born again. Make sure you are saved. Make sure your sins are forgiven. Then there is nothing to worry about really. Make sure you are a child of God. Then there is nothing to worry about really. Make sure there is no condemnation in your heart. Make sure the devil cannot point a cursing finger at you saying about this or about that. Then there is nothing to worry about. Free. Free from sin. 
Free from condemnation, free from fear, free from inner private defeat, free. Glorious experience of freedom, nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. Sure, you are not worried about the faces of the people. Nothing to worry about. I'm sure you are not worried about the actions of the people. Nothing to worry about. I'm sure you are not worried about your provision. Nothing to worry about. Nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. If there is nothing to worry about, in Jesus' name we pray. If the enemies cannot control your life anymore, in Jesus' name we pray. If you have taken the key now out of the hands of the enemy, the key of your life, the key of your progress, and the cree of your joy and happiness. If you have said, give me the key. That's my key. My key is not in your hand anymore. I said, give me the key. Say that, give me the key. And don't give that key back to the enemy anymore to open the door to get your life. If the key now is in your hand, in Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. You are going back to your house with the key today. The key to your joy. The key to your happiness. The key to your freedom. And now that you are free, you know why people who succeed, you know why they succeed? Because they are not worrying about anything. Students who have nothing to worry about, and all they do is just reach and study the past. And workers who have nothing to worry about, and they just walk and walk, they always have prosperity. And tonight, see, the key is now in your hand, and there's nothing to worry about anymore. Success has come. Prosperity has come. Joy has come. Even before the prayer, healing has come. You know, when you know that you cannot die, when you know that you cannot die, that it is not time to die yet. I said it is not time to die yet. When you know that, and you're not worried about sickness, you're not worried about dying, you're not worried about hunger, whatever it is, all right, you'll be very strong. And you're, you are strong from tonight. Where are you today? Where are you today? I said there's nothing to worry about. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you tonight because we know we have got this revelation now. There is nothing to worry about. And Lord, I proclaim freedom for all your people tonight. In Jesus' name. All the enemies of the people of God will take the key out of your hand. The key to their progress and the key to their lives and the key to the fulfillment of their lives is no more in the enemy's hand. The key now is in your own hand. Whatever you decree will be done in Jesus' name. Any door you open with prayer will be opened in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, I pray that all your people tonight here and everywhere they are set free tonight in Jesus' name. In the day, there's nothing to worry about. In the night, there's nothing to worry about. In the place of work, there's nothing to worry about. In the church, there's nothing to worry about. Everywhere we go, there's nothing to worry about. Confirm it in Jesus' name. For the widows who are missed among us, provide for them in Jesus' name. The orphans and the fatherless and motherless among us, provide for them in Jesus' name. 
all our students who have been going for exams and they are worried, no more worry, no more anxiety. Give them success in Jesus' name. All our people who are working, trading, whatever work they are doing, prosperity and promotion. Progress will come again in Jesus' name. And those who have not married, O oh Lord, clear all the hurdles out of the way. Take all the hindrances out of the way. Lord, we proclaim for them tonight, the wife will come. The husband will come. They build a great home in Jesus' name. For all our pastors, all our leaders, all our workers that are getting tired in the work of the Lord and they are worried and anxious about this and that, we proclaim tonight for all your ministers, nothing to worry about again in Jesus' name. No evil eye will see you. No evil hand will touch you. From today, you live a life that is happy. A life that is holy, a life that is prosperous, and from tonight every chain is broken. All the yokes are destroyed. All the fetters are taken away. Go back home and go and succeed. Go back home and go and have progress. Go back home and be free. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go back home, as you go back home, as you 